All right, thank you, Jimena. Thank you very much. Um, this is March, in case you're not walk watching a calendar or have completely lost track of time. And that means there is a new theme in the wind for our classes. And this week with, uh, with March usually means you're gonna see signs of spring at some uh, stage in your travels around wherever you live, uh, flowers bursting out of the ground, things like that, trees getting a few buds. Um, and with that in mind, I have come up with the uh, theme of uh, fantastic florals for March. So we're gonna be doing a lot of still life paintings and you know, sort of garden theme stuff. And I've picked out a bunch of, I seem to be leaning heavily on the French artists uh, lately, but I can't help myself because they're, they're very good and they, and they always have stuff that uh, people love. So um, we're gonna start with a uh, painting by Edouard Manet, who was an early French pre-impressionist, I guess you could call, and definitely knew you know, people like Claude Monet and Camille Pissarro and Paul Cezanne and, and other French artists of that era. Um, and that is, is what we're gonna be uh, working on. And we're gonna be working oils today, which I will confess is my favorite medium to work in. Um, it's very fluid, very uh, flexible. You can push the paint around. Um, and hopefully I'll, I'll show you some tips that'll make that process a little bit more uh, palatable and, and digestible for you. Um, so we'll, we'll be delving into um, the wonderful world of oil paintings and uh, oil painting. And so with that, let's take a look at the supplies. And I've actually listed, um, sometimes I just sort of give you a kind of a general list. This is, is, this is ex exactly what I'm gonna be using today. Um, if you don't have exactly what I have here, um, it is not uh, the end of the world by any stretch of the imagination. Even if you don't have oils and you wanna work in acrylics, this definitely will apply. Um, just know that your acrylics are gonna dry a lot faster and you're not gonna be able to push that paint around as much. So the colors I've got here are titanium white, uh, the artist's loft. Uh, these are the academic level uh, ones. So they're sort of more entry level. Um, I think they're priced around four or $5 a tube. So they're, they're pretty, uh, pretty accessible. Um, yellow ochre, raw umber, cerulean blue hue is the blue that I've, I've got. A uh, brilliant red, which is kind of like a stop sign red, uh, and then medium yellow, which is sort of the equivalent of like a cadmium yellow, uh, sort of a nice strong primary yellow. Those are the the six colors that I'm using, and then I've got a, some oil painting medium, um, a rag or paper towels. I've actually got both today, um, and then some sort of container for putting your medium in if it's not already in a container, um, and then a whole slew of different um, acrylic slash oil painting brushes. I use um, brushes for acrylics and for oils. There's some people that like to keep them separate. I feel uh, I'm very keen on making sure that my brushes are washed really well. So if you keep your brushes washed well, clean them up really good, um, they should be interchangeable between oils and acrylics. So um, I, I don't have any issues with that. And then we're gonna need something to paint on. I put cotton or linen, uh, canvas, wood, paper. I'm gonna actually be painting on wood, which I'll get it into in a second. And then a disposable palette or a plastic palette. So that is your supply list. Um, this is the painting that we're gonna be working on. This is Edouard Manet, and that is the correct spelling. I triple checked it. Uh, it's not Edward, like we say here in the West, it's Edouard, it's French, so it's got a little uh, panache to it. And then flowers in a crystal vase from 1882. So if you want to Google that and pull an image off the internet, you can. Or if you want to screenshot this one, um, that is also an option and sort of set it off to the side. I've got a bigger version that I use um, sort of off to the side when I'm painting. Um, you might want to do the same. So that is... <clears throat> pardon me, is the painting that we will be working from. So have a look at it, screenshot it, and we'll be ready to go. Okay. And as always, if you have questions um, or anything, just put them in the chat and Jimena will um, uh, pass them off to me and hopefully we can uh, get your questions answered. All right. So without further ado, 
let's have a look here. So as I said, I'm painting on wood um, and I'm actually using, I, I've opened this up here. I'm using these uh, wood art panel, panels. This is a uh, five pack that you can get at Michael's. It's artist loft brand. And it looks like it's just sort of like a particle board with some veneer on it. Um, so they, they actually look like this. And so they look like, you know, plywood. So you can use plywood, you can use MDF panels, which is sort of particle board. Um, you just want something that doesn't have a ton of uh, really deep grooves in it, unless you want to incorporate that into your painting, obviously. Um, so these are great. These are eight by 10. Um, and I have put gesso on these. So this is the way I've done it. I've actually got a two-parter here. So this one here is, is the, um, the kind of the basic entry-level gesso um, coat. So I'll just do stage one. It looks like this. Stage two with a layer of the plain white gesso on it. Actually, I this is stained a little bit. It's got some yellow ochre in it, but it's a it's this is sort of a thinner coat. So I put a thinner coat of gesso on first. And then if I feel like I need to sand that down with some sandpaper, I do it. And then this one is the one I'll be painting on. And this is a coat of the professional white gesso. You do not have to do it in this order. This is just the way I've done it. Um, the professional is a little bit thicker. It's a little bit he more heavily pigmented. It's got a little bit more body to it. Um, so it's two coats, um, one coat of this, one coat of that. You could do two coats of this or two, two or I would use three coats of this because this is a little bit thinner. But you're, you're definitely probably not going to be able to get away with one coat of gesso. You should always do uh, at least two coats. Um, and this one I have stained with a little bit of yellow ochre in, a, and all of this is acrylics. So this was this board was probably about 90% this, and then 10% of the pigment, just to kind of warm it up a little bit, to make it so it's not pure bright white. Uh, and if you've watched my um, stuff in the past, you know that I kind of like to get rid of that really, really strong white. Uh, it just makes for a better surface to paint on. So that is what I'm painting on. This is eight by 10. You can work bigger. Um, I probably wouldn't work too much smaller than this. Um, Nine by 12 would be perfect, uh, 12 by 16, something like that would be fine as well. Um, but, and it, it also does not have to be wood. It can be uh, canvas, it can even be paper. Just make sure that you've got gesso on there. Sometimes canvas will come pre-prepared with a gesso already on it, and sometimes panels will too. Um, although that's a little bit more of a rarity to have that. Okay, with that, I think we're ready to go. We do so. have a couple of questions, Mike. Oh yeah, go for it. Um, Let's hear it. So one is, uh, if someone forgot to get linseed oil, um, what options do we have? Um, if you've got some mineral spirits, preferably odorless mineral spirits, that would be great. Um, if you have some sort of uh, oil, uh, oil painting medium, which is basically synthetic uh, linseed oil, that'd be great. What I use, and I, and I said, you know, get your container, I've got my little basil pesto container here. And what I've done is I've mixed about half linseed oil and half oil painting medium. This is a uh, liquid by Winsor Newton. So it's a 50, 50 mix. And I like to mix them together because the liquid, the oil painting medium, it generally speeds up the drying time. So if you use just linseed oil, that has a really, really slow drying time. So if we were, if, for instance, if this were a two-parter and I use linseed oil as my medium, it's very possible that this painting could still be a little tacky by next week. Um, with this, with the, with the medium in it, with the quick drying medium, the liquid, um, that will speed the drying time up and it'll be ready to go. I could probably paint on this tomorrow with this being dry by tomorrow. So, um, you, but to answer your question, you don't necessarily need a, a medium. Um, I have a friend who's been a landscape painter for 30 years and she's never used medium. I don't know how she does it, but she does. She does. She, I think she just uses a lot heavier, thicker paint. Um, I like to start kind of thin and then build it up that way. Um, so if you're inclined that way, medium is probably a good choice for you. But if you want to use just sort of a lot of 
kind of heavy uh, paint and, and work in a more impasto uh, a la prima method, then uh, you're probably fine without using any kind of medium. So uh, hopefully that answered your question and it probably answered other questions that nobody asked, but there you go, <laughs> that's just me. You never know. Anything else? Uh, yes, so um, I'll ask two and one. So can we use acrylic gesso and acrylic medium and does Gamsol work? Um, you do not wanna use acrylic medium with oil paints at all. Um, it, it will be a disaster, um, so don't. <laughs> Um, oh, I can't open this thing. Um, I would, I would definitely use Gamsol. Gamsol will work. That's a good substitute. Um, so yeah, try, uh, try Gamsol, try, try anything that's oil-based, um, you know, medium wise. And there's tons of products out there that are, that are oil-based mediums. So, um, you know, do a little hunting and pecking and see what you find. Um, but if you don't have it, you don't have it. And you definitely can paint without it, but it, it does make your life a little bit easier. It just gives you options for making things thinner. There we go. Right on cue. <laughs> okay. Well, any other questions out there? Yeah, a couple more. Um, instead okay. of liquid, what would you suggest for water mix mixable oil paints? In, instead, of, instead of water? Liquid. Instead of liquid. Yeah. Um, well, there's a lot of mediums that are made specifically for um, oil-based or water-based oils. I, to be honest, have not used water-based oils a lot at all. I, I have heard that you can use basically anything that you would use with oil paints with them. Um, the only thing that's different with those is you can use water, from what I understand, to kind of thin them out a little bit. Um, so that does add one little wrinkle to the, the whole equation with water-based oils. But I don't want to get too deep down that well because I honestly don't want to give you bad information. And I, I truly don't know a whole lot about water-based oils other than what they do and what the idea is behind them. So I'm sorry I'm not better on that than, than I am, but there are yeah. limits to my knowledge. <laughs> It's okay. It's all good. Um, one last question before we get started. Um, do we need to um, add any acrylic layer right now before uh, we start with the oil painting? Well, this, the, the piece of wood, which started like this and now is like this, has two layers of acrylic gesso on it. The reason I use acrylic gesso is it dries a ton faster. There, there are other things that you can treat your surface that you're going to paint with. Uh, acrylic gesso is by far the easiest, most accessible one. Um, but with oils, you should definitely coat whatever surface you're going to be painting on. Um, and I would say the absolute first one that you would need to coat, if you're going to work on paper, definitely make sure it's got gesso on it. Um, canvas would probably be second. You could probably get away with, with, uh, painting directly onto wood. Um, but you know, if you make the next great American painting, it's not going to last very long. It's going to deteriorate probably in five years because oil is, is basically a corrosive element um, and it'll ruin the surface that you're painting on. So you definitely need uh, a gesso on there, acrylic based, preferably. Perfect. And that's it. Let's get started. All right. Let's get to it. So I'm going to start <clears throat> as I usually start. Um, and that is with a quick little sketch. Um, and by sketch, I mean a uh, uh, simple color here of raw umber, anything earthy. Um, it doesn't have to be raw umber. You could use yellow ochre. Um, you could use yellow ochre, raw umber mixed. You could, you could honestly use blue. Now, I don't know if you noticed that. This is actually something I really wanted to show you. So I squeeze that out. And if you look down there a little bit closer, you see how that's basically all just oil. Um, that happens a lot. So what I have is I've got a paper towel here. And a way to prevent that is if you've got that happening, you just squeeze it out and you see how it's sort of forming a halo. That's all the oil. So I poured the paint out and I've allowed this paper towel here to start absorbing that oil 
out because it, it gets really squirrely and it's really hard to work. It's, it's like kind of trying to paint with uh, like an oil slick. Um, it doesn't work very well, it's not very user friendly. So I like to control how much oil there is. So I wanna get any excess oil out and this is the way I do it. And I just let this sit for a little bit. I'm, you know, if I'm gonna maybe speed things up and maybe dab it a little bit here, get a little bit off the top. But a lot of that oil is now gone. So what I can do is I can just take this and you can see all the oil that's left over there. It's really uh, quite a bit. And now this paint is ready to use to, at, at the viscosity uh, that, I, that I want to, to be working with. So that's a little tip that I wanted to show you today. Um, just, you know, if you're worried about the paint having a lot of oil, like this one did, just squeeze it out onto a paper towel and it really eliminates that. I would probably, un, under normal circumstances, um, you know, maybe go get a cup of tea or something like that and, and let this drain out a little bit more, but we're gonna get started. This is pretty good and I, I think we're ready to go. So the brush that I'm gonna use uh, is sort of my typical starting brush. It's just a nice round brush and it's part of these sets here. These, are, these have turned out to be really great. Um, they're very, and they're especially great for this stage where you're just sort of boxing things in and not worrying about too much precision. Um, this is a round, it's a synthetic sable. It's the size six. I've probably used this brush as much as anything else. Um, maybe this one and this one, the six and the four. I might actually use the four, so I'll put the six off to the side. Um, but these are really good. They're kind of like pens. Um, and, and, and what I'm doing now is I'm drawing essentially. So I'm going to do that. These brushes, the, um, the bristle brushes are a little rougher and I'll probably use those later, but both of these sets I have available to me. Um, you obviously don't need this and I will not use all of these brushes. I'll probably use maybe four or five at the most, um, but these are both two good different types uh, of brushes that I'll have at my, my disposal. Just make sure they're not watercolor brushes. All right, so I've got my medium here. And um, I think what I'll do is I'll just take a little bit of the medium out, put it right next to my paint. Set this off to the side, put it somewhere where it won't spill and I'm ready to go. So I'm just gonna get a little bit of medium because I, I like to have it kind of the consistency of about of ink. And I'm just going to sketch, I'm going to sketch out the composition here. And uh, by the composition, I mean, where is everything located on the page? This is a fairly straightforward painting. There's not a lot of moving parts, um, but I do have, uh, you know, kind of a slightly lowered composition. So, you know, the, the weight of the painting is on the lower end of the page. It's not perfectly centered. It's not off to the right. It's not off to the left but it is a little bit lower. So what I like to do, and I don't worry about, you know, making uh, everything perfect at this stage. I'm just trying to find maybe the top and, or the bottom. I could turn around and make it the top, but I'm not going to, uh, like that. Uh, left side, right side. And I'm just looking at like, like how much space is over here and how much space is over here. It's pretty much, I'd say this, this central vase, the blue vase, I guess they call it, or crystal vase, not a blue vase. It's got some blue in it. I'm just trying to figure out kind of the proportions here. Is it equally divided into thirds? One, two, three, that's kind of the way I've got it. It kind of looks like it. And if you're, if you're not sure, you can always go to the source material, whether it be an actual still life. Um, it's pretty much thirds, so I'm gonna go with that. And what I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna start dividing things up. Um, the, the vase itself is taller than it is wide. So compositionally, that's kind of be, gonna be one of the primary things that I do right off the bat. And now I'm just gonna sort of figure out kind of roughly where things lie here. I was way off with that. The great thing about oils, oh, look, it's still wet. I can just get rid of it no problem at all. With acrylics, I'd be like, you know, I, I got three minutes before it dries. I gotta, I gotta hurry up. This one, I don't worry about that so much. So you can do a little bit. And you notice, you notice how I'm holding the brush here. 
I'm holding it really loose. It's, you know, I'm not writing an essay. This isn't a college, you know, it's, it's not a college uh, literature course or anything like that. I'm not, I'm not writing an essay. I'm, I'm just doing quick, straight kind of shorthand notes um, of, of where things are gonna go. It's kind of like, uh, you know, like a, a court, those people that the stenographers that do it, they do everything really fast. And, you know, you look at it and it might say, the accused stands here before us, blah, blah, blah. And it might be like three, three letters or three lines of, of just, you know, very shorthand version of what's being said. That's kind of what we're doing here uh, visually. So I'm just, I'm just referencing the main shapes here, not worrying really about anything in the background because there's no, there's no sense of diagonals or, you know, there's a, there's a the vague hint of a tabletop back here, which maybe I can reference um, just to kind of divide things up. But in here, we kind of got these dark little shapes where all the foliage is and these three, one, two, three, look like kind of white roses or something like that. And then there's this red one over here, put that there. And then this sort of top layer of multicolored smaller flowers. Not, not really trying to map out everyone, just trying to get uh, a, a, just a, a sense of where the main elements are located. So one, two, three, those are the three that I, I think are, are really important to understanding how this composition works. Um, and then I can kind of work, work from there. So my, my uh, yeah, oh, go ahead, go ahead. Sorry, we have a couple of questions. Um, so the first one is, uh, could you repeat the name of the medium you're using today, please? Oh yeah, so my the medium I, that I use is, is Liquin, which is a really common one. It's a product by Windsor Newton. You can get it pretty much at any arts and craft stores. Um, and then I mix it with 50-50 with linseed oil, um, which is flax oil. And the reason I like, it's sort of a nice in-between. I feel like the, the Liquin dries quickly, but sometimes it, tack, it gets a little too tacky too quickly. So the uh, linseed oil sort of extends it a little bit. Um, but there are tons, the Gamblin has some, uh, Sennelier is another, it's a French one. Um, there's a German company that produces, it, pretty much anybody that is involved with, with oil uh, painting supplies has their kind of brand of uh, medium. So uh, th they're all sort of the same thing. Perfect, and that would be the butter, butterscotch um, looking liquid that you have. Yeah, this right stuff there, right? right here. That's the medium. And this is particularly yellow because it's sort of been sitting in a box for a while. I haven't, I haven't used this one. When you leave it out, when it's exposed to light, it gets clearer. So it's oftentimes will be, will be thinner. This is as pretty much as dark and as thick as it'll get. Okay, so I think we've got everything. Now what I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna kind of block in a little bit um, I love working with oils because it's like I'm talking and the paint's still exactly the same as when I left it last. So da -da -da -da, look at that, there's some dark, dark shape there. Just trying to get maybe a little bit of, of light and dark um, oriented here. Not worrying too much, like this is a little darker in here, all this blue, so I might add a little more pigment, a little less medium, uh, just to sort of give myself uh, an idea of where things are, are going to go. I'm going to put obviously color over top of this, but it, it gives me uh, a, a reference point uh, to work from. And nice and loose, still holding it way up here, sort of halfway between. Uh, I'm not trying to be too specific. I think this changes the way you make marks when you do this. This changes the way you, you make marks. You want to make these kind of marks, nice and loose. So Mike, um, talking of uh, paintbrushes, um, when would you use a long handle brush instead of a short handle brush? What's the difference? And yeah, for, for stuff like this, um, if, if, you, if you look at some old pictures of like um, Henri Matisse, he would, he would make brushes that were like three or four feet long and almost broom handles. And he'd do these really big paintings and he'd you know, have to almost use two hands because he wanted it really loose. He wanted to be able to stand back from it. 
So really, you know, whatever you're doing, this is probably about as long as I would use for a painting of this size. You don't need anything more than this. I mean, this makes it almost a little awkward when you got it that long, but I got it about halfway. You know, I've got, I don't know, what about four or five inches there that I'm, uh, you know, it's between me and the actual mark. So, you know, it's really kind of a personal feel, but I really encourage you to kind of, you know, work like this to kind of loosen things up. All right, so I wanna get right into the color here. Um, so I wanna start with this, this background. I've got a lot of gray in the background. So what I'm gonna do, uh, mixing up gray can often be very tricky. Um, so I'm gonna start with blue. Um, and this is my uh, cerulean blue hue, but like I said, um, anything will work. I just wanna make sure that it, there, it doesn't have a lot of oil. So I'll just put a little bit of this out as is. And then I'll use some of this brown and I'm gonna definitely use some white. Um, let me just start with those two and see how that looks. I am not one of those people that um, has a little booklet of all the color charts and how to mix them. I, I, I try to go a little bit more intuitively and by what I see. Um, so I'm just going to take a little bit of this brown, a little bit of this blue. And like I said, you know, whatever blue you got will probably get you pretty close to where you want to go. So you can see I've kind of made a dark uh, bluish, brownish something or other. I'll put a little more brown in there. This is probably not going to be exactly the color that I want, but it's going to be close. And then this is obviously too dark. So that's where the white comes in. And so I'll set this aside and I'll just take about half of it. I like to kind of incrementally mix my colors, meaning I don't like to, you know, take the gob of everything and put them all together because you'll often not get the right color. And then you'll be left with all of this excess paint. So this is looking way too blue for me. So maybe I'll throw in a little bit more brown. Now it's getting a little bit more brown. Let's throw some of that in there. That's, that's actually looking pretty good. And sometimes, you know, when I've got a pretty limited palette that I'm working with. Um, and sometimes you're not going to have the right blue. Sometimes you're not going to have the right earth color. I'm just trying to get as close of an appro uh, approximation as I can. So this is getting there. Uh, it's still a little, it's still reading a little bit to my eye, like a little too greenish almost. So the, um, the brown is having kind of a, a yellow effect on it. So if I want to, if I want to neutralize a color, meaning take it away from its root. So the, I would say the root of this color, if I had to and assign a color to it, I'd say it's sort of a greenish gray. So I want to make it more gray. I want to make it kind of more what's, what's there. So I'm just going to take a little bit of red. Red, if you look at a color wheel, if you don't know what a color wheel is, just Google it. And there'll be 12 colors on a color wheel, generally speaking. The ones that are opposite each other, so the opposite of green is red, um, that will neutralize that color. So it'll make it more like a gray. So I'm gonna take some of this red, not a lot of it, and I'm gonna throw this in to the mix and just a little bit. So a little bit of red. Oh, it wants to go pink, but it can't because there's too much blue and there's too much brown. A little bit more in there. Actually, I'm going to put a little bit because I'm starting to see a little bit of, of purple. So I'm going to sort of add red and yellow to kind of get a little purple action going on. Let's try a little bit more. These get a little darker, I think. Oh, maybe too much blue. And there's a fair amount of this color in here. So I'm, um, yeah, there we go. That's looking more like it. All right, I'm, I'm gonna go with that. So this is, this is the color I've, I've come up with. Come on, away from there, about like that. I think that's gonna do it. And this is gonna give us a lot of mileage um, because there's a lot of that color in there. And I'm gonna use a, a very different brush I'm going to use 
a, um, <clears throat> this is a bristle brush, so it's a little rougher. And uh, it is, this is actually called a filbert because you can see it's kind of rounded at the top. You can use a flat um, and you can really use a round here. It doesn't really matter. I just, I'm just going by the size. This is gonna give me a fair amount of coverage, but it's also gonna allow me to kind of work around the edges a little bit. So I am going to start laying this in. And if you look at the painting that we're, we're referencing here, there is, oh, that's pretty good. If you look at the color, there's quite a bit of, you know, sort of warmer spots and cooler spots and a little bit darker. So this does not have to be um, solid, straight, um, even color. The Impressionists were all about kind of modulated color and kind of building it up um, in little swatches. Um, so we don't have to be perfect with this. Oh, I love oils. I've been so worried about the drying time for so long. Now I don't have to worry about it. It's lovely. And I'm just, I'm just basically blocking in everything around the, the flowers at this stage. And it's gonna be like, wow, all right, we've got a painting all of a sudden. Allowing some of that uh, kind of warmer background color to kind of creep out there a little bit. That's a pretty good match. I'm throwing a tiny bit of medium in there, um, but my sense is the, the uh, Impressionists and, and certainly this painting, this was done in a very kind of free flowing, uh, heavy, direct painting kind of approach. So there's, there's not a lot of sort of working from dark to light or any kind of classical um, methodology to things. It was, it was much more kind of a spontaneous um, application of color. Trying to paint and talk can be difficult sometimes. If I lose my train of thought, I apologize. Mike, um, we have a question yes. here. Um, the sets of brushes that you showed um, earlier, are they by Artist Loft? They are. They're Artist Loft. They're, I think they're about 10 bucks a, uh, for an entire set. Um, and they've been holding up great. They're cheap. Um, they're, they're not, you know, they're not going to last you for 20 years but they are great entry-level brushes. Um, really, uh, you'll, get a, you'll, you'll definitely get your money's worth out of them. Perfect, thank you. Yeah. And now here we, we start to kind of fade into sort of a, uh, a, a, lighter, a lighter tone. And it looks to be a little bit warmer too. I'm just gonna throw this shadow in here. And this shadow is a little bit bluer. So I'm just gonna take some of that blue and kind of pull it into that gray a little bit. There we go. Something like that. And now I'm just gonna start throwing some of this white. I know that I'm probably gonna warm this up. Um, and, and with that in mind, I'm gonna take some of this yellow. You might say yellow, what's he talking about? I don't see any yellow in there. I'm just trying to read the temperature. And, and this, this reads is a little bit warmer. Than this. This is blue. This is definitely a cool color back here. This is definitely a little bit warmer. I think there's probably going to be a, a little bit of yellow in there. And I'm going to put my yellow ochre. So this pretty much gets all of the colors that I have at my disposal. And I'm going to put the yellow up there with my other earth tone, the uh, umber. So my earth tones and then my three primaries, kind of like this. There is a little bit of method to this madness, but I'm not a huge like get your palette perfectly organized kind of uh, painter either. So now I'm just taking some of this white and I'm just gonna kind of blend this in. Still mixing the kind of the dirty leftovers that I've got in here. A little bit more of that white. White will go really fast. So you're gonna to have to replenish it 
fairly frequently. Starting to build up a sweat here. Right. All right, so now I'm, I'm getting a lot of kind of residual um, of this here. So I'm just gonna take my, I'm just gonna not completely clean it, but I am going to get out a lot of the heavy paint uh, that's on there. So now just going straight white. So it's still gray, but it's kind of a lighter gray. I don't know about the yellow. I don't know if we're gonna need the yellow as much as I thought. Couple lighter spots up here. I'll kind of throw it into the background. We got everything blocked in. There, there is my there's my stage. I could I could probably fiddle with this bit a little bit more, um, but I want to get to some other stuff here. There's one little shadow under here that I want to uh, get sorted out, so it sort of sits that vase on top of it. Um, what I might do here is I might just transition right into this area um, where I've got all this light. I am gonna change brushes because um, this brush has really gotten inundated with this gray. Don't be afraid to move around with your brushes. I mean, I think that's a, a big trap that people fall into. They have a brush, they're painting, and they just sort of use the same thing. And by the end, they got sort of a nice gray like this, and you've got no real, um, sense of light and dark or anything. It's kind of all pulled into the middle. So, you know, pull, pull some new brushes into the mix. I'm going to use a little bit of this warm yellow, and then I'm going to throw a little bit of this gray in here. And what I'm doing is I'm just, I'm just grabbing some of the light in here. Not trying to get it perfect at this stage, uh, just again, blocking things in a little bit. So Mike, okay. we have another question here. Um, yeah. Could you recommend a bristle brush set? Yeah, I'd, I'd use the same bristle brush set that, um, that I was showing you earlier, this one right here. It's the same thing, but just instead of these synthetic sables, You've got a whole array of bristle brushes. And I think you get, I don't know, 20 brushes or something like that. And that's what I'm using right now. And they've worked great. Um, and they're, they're also at Artist Loft. They're really cheap. Um, should have no trouble finding them. They're always in stock. I mean, it's just sort of a standard, uh, standard issue item. Perfect, thank you. Sure. All right, so what I'm going to start doing now is I'm going to start. Um, what am I going to do? I've got two, I've got two conflicting things here. I'm going, to, I'm going to, I've got some white on my brush. I'm just going to sort of lay in some, some whites to start with. So I'm just going to put in a little white, a little bit of red, sort of give that sort of pinkish hue to it. There's a little bit of that over here. So I'm just going to block this in. And once again, I'm, I'm, you know, sort of towards the middle of my brush, nice and loose. These are impressionists. They're not trying to fool you. There's, these aren't photorealistic or anything like that. These are paintings. They're very expressive. They're very loose. Um, so uh, have fun with the brushwork and let some of that underpainting uh, come through. Now this one here, this, this white one has a little bit more gray in it. Um, so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go back to that brush that I had, that was my gray brush, and take a little bit more white. And just kind of block that in like so. It's kind of got this sort of flare to it, kind of coming out from that center point. And it really defines the edge, like it separates these two flowers. And then around the, around the end, around the tips, it gets a little bit brighter. So I'll just use that other brighter white brush that I've had. 
Let's throw some of that in there. All right, that looks pretty good. So these are my white brushes. I think I'm pretty good. Oh, I got another one up here. Let's use that. Throw that up there. So these are all, I'm sort of working from light uh, to dark, which is slightly odd, but it'll be, it'll work. Um, now I'm going to throw in some greens. So I'm going to use uh, the, the brush that I originally used to lay in with the brown to do the, the quick color, the quick uh, sketch. I'm going to take a little bit of blue. I don't have a green here. I actually do have, if I need to cheat, I've got this little 24 pack oil painting set, which is also very cheap, has a ton of colors, um, 24 different ones, like mostly earth tones and then sort of secondary colors and maybe primaries. If I need to, I'll use that, but I'm gonna try and mix everything with this really limited uh, palette that I've got here. So I'm just taking a little bit of this cerulean blue hue, mixing it with the, the what is it called? Brilliant yellow or medium yellow is what they call it. And I'm just gonna start, actually that seems a little too intense, um, meaning a little bit too green. Like this is sort of more of a muted green. So I'm gonna take some of this brown. All right, so there's that. So now I'm just gonna kind of block in some of these nice, that's a pretty good match. I don't know, maybe I've stumbled upon the lost palette of Edouard Manet because all of these colors seem to be doing pretty good. I doubt it though. He would not have used a color called cerulean blue hue. He would have used cerulean blue, the actual cerulean blue. Whenever you see that, I've, I've mentioned this a few times, but whenever you see like hue, like cadmium yet yellow hue, it means that it's made to look like cadmium, but it is not actually got cadmium in it. It is, is kind of like a, a laboratory substitute for it. And generally when you see hues, um, those are made for colors that have very expensive pigments in it. So cadmium is very expensive. Um, uh, cerulean is very expensive. And so you, you'll, you'll see painting companies go, oh, let's, let's make them think we've got the really expensive colors. And really they're just kind of usually pretty accurate, I have to admit, pretty accurate imitations of the color they're trying to get you to believe that you're using. All right. So I'm just kind of laying in a little bit of that green. All right, that looks good. Um, I'm going to get another brush here because I want to move into a completely different realm of colors. And I'm going to use, uh, I'll use a sort of a smaller flat um, bristle brush, but I think either one would, would actually work at this stage. And I'm going to use, um, I've run out of my blue. I'm going to try and get these blue little flowers in here. And this blue, Anybody see that blue that, that make it into the picture? I think it did. Yep, I can see it, or we can see it. Plenty, no problem. Cool. All right, so take that. This blue up here is not this blue here. I think it needs to be a little bit more dull. This is a, probably a little bit bright. So I'm taking a little bit of my earth tone, raw umber, kind of mixing it with it. And I think that'll work. So now I'm just gonna go right over my brown conveniently enough. And I mean, you see how I'm, I'm trying to kind of mimic uh, the, the, the pattern that they're making. Some of this looks a little bit dark. So I'll just take a little bit of white and get that blue a little bit more light. And I'm using some really heavy, let's get a little close up here. This is starting to get interesting. You're getting, you're getting some heavy paint in there, some what's called impasto paint, thick paint. Uh, any more blue? Just throw a little bit in there. There's a lot of blue down at the bottom in the crystal. So I'm gonna kind of add that in here and just, just trying to follow, follow the contour of the glass here, just kind of goes around like this. Just follow some of that. 
throw throw in a little spots like that. Any more blue in here? Looks like a little bit more of a green kind of like reflective light kind of in here. And this is the part everybody loves when you when you do reflective glass. You just take a few slabs of white and just go doop doop doop. Oh, look at that! It's reflective. That's awesome. Easy to do, and the impressionists were really good at it when they did still lights. Anyway, all right. What else we got here? Let's do some let's do some reds. I'm gonna get to another brush here. I'm gonna use a round, this is a round bristle brush. This is sort of one that's not part of the kit, but there are ones that are exactly like this in the kit. Um, let's do a little bit of kind of a yellowish, earthy yellow, maybe a little bit of, yeah, let's throw some of that in here. I've kind of added a little, uh, I gotta add a little heft to my flowers because I, I made this part a little bit too big. It's all right. So I just added a little red to that. Let's see if there's any more. And then we got this over here, which is sort of a reddish, almost a purple. And I need more red. So Mike, a question here from Lois. Um, yeah. How do you store leftover um, oil paint on your palette so it doesn't dry out? Um, there's lots of different things you can do. I, my slightly idiosyncratic way of doing it is I get a bunch of like, um, like if I've, if I wanted to store it exactly the way I've been working on it, I'll, I'll clean up some stuff <coughs> and then just take <coughs> old, um, you know, like yogurt containers, or whatever, and I'll just put them right over top of it. So when I come back the next day, it'll still be, uh, it'll still be intact. So, uh, but there's lots of different ways. Some people store them in the freezer. I've never done that. Um, I've heard mixed reviews about that uh, way of doing it. You just sort of wrap them up and uh, kind of put them in the freezer and they, and then get them out, you know, like an hour or so before you're going to use it. Um, I'm now I'm mixing up a sort of a light purple here. I'm just doing two things at once. Um, so, you know, there's, there's lots of, there's lots of sort of tricks of the trade to kind of get that um, paint to, to stay fresh, uh, but generally oil paint, uh, if, if you cover it up with something like an old, uh, like if you get like a curry takeout or something, those thin trays, if you put them in those, actually, I've got one sitting around here somewhere. Um, and then put the cap back on. That's a great way. It basically, you want to seal them off from as much um, from as much uh, air as you possibly can. That's the key. Keep them out of the air. All right. Um, now I'm going to go back and, and kind of work in a little bit here around this. I went a little bit too, too deep. So I'm just going to kind of work a little reductively, work around the stuff that I've already painted. So just a little back and forth. So I've got that, that color that I've mixed up off to the side. And now I'm just going back and using that to kind of clean things up a little bit. Maybe leave a little, you know, a few little dashes of light in there. But generally, it's, uh, trying to just clean things up. And we got a little bit of hints of, you know, kind of the inner workings of the flower. So another question here, Mike. Um, yeah. Manet's glass base uh, looks like glass. How, how did he do that or how do you get there? Well, uh, hopefully I'm getting there. Um, and the main thing that you do is, is you get the color right. So I think this maybe needs to get a little darker. So let's do that. So you get that sort of really strong contrast. Generally, generally speaking, uh, glass is all about reflection um, and getting 
And getting a, a reflective surface, it's important to get a real sort of high degree of contrast. So I, I've got all the, the flowers or the foliage in there pretty good. Maybe you could get a little darker, but that's that's pretty good. And then then the the kind of piece de resistance, the grand flourish here is just take that white. And I did it earlier. Let's see if I can do it again. And you just sort of pull that through and give it a little bit of reflection. And then along the edge to just sort of separating it. Any more reflective stuff going on? Let's see. Maybe a little bit more of this blue down here. Sort of a hint of some, some blue crystal. So something, something like that. But th these, these little, this strong highlight against this really dark, uh, you know, sort of under painting the, the, the stems of those flowers, that contrast creates that sense of light and, and, and reflection. So hopefully that explains it a little bit. All right, what else? We're getting close to the end here. I, wanna, I do wanna end uh, a little bit early so I can show you how to clean up. So I'm taking a little bit of, that up. there you go. Taking a little bit of kind of a dark here and just putting a few little hints of, of where that base is sitting. Let's do a little bit of darkening here. I'm kind of doing it on the fly, so hopefully you can see what I'm doing. You can always go back and watch and watch the tape at home. You know, you got football coaches who sit with their teams and watch the, the football tapes. Well, you can go watch the painting tapes. Much more exciting. Uh, what else here? All right. Here's a little bit of red. So now, now I'm just kind of throwing the kitchen sink at it. Well, I got a big red flower here that's not in the original, but at this stage, it's my painting and I can do whatever I want, right? All right, let's see. Get some more of this white. This, this white flower just got bigger. So it's a nice sort of loose impressionistic hint of spring happening here. All right, see some more orange flowers over here. Let's get a little touch of that in there. A little bit right up there. I don't know. I'm feeling that that's pretty close. Wipe off my excess paint. I'm gonna go back to this blue. And maybe fill in some of the gap here. A little bit of variety in, in the in the color here. There's some sort of greenish blues and and more purple blues, so it kind of adds a nice little rich arrangement there. I don't know, I'm, I'm, I'm feeling pretty good about that. This is, I think this is the first that I've actually finished the painting before we, we have time. I, I'm not finished, I would, I would fiddle with this, but there is something that I do wanna show you before um, we go on. So I'm gonna widen this out a little bit. Okay, so I got this big mess of paint. Um, I want to show you how to clean your brushes without using solvent. Uh, a lot of people will just sort of throw their, their paint brushes and um, throw them in solvent and do it that way. That works fine. It, it's totally effective. It's been done for thousands of years, probably, um, certainly hundreds of years. Um, I'm only going to do one, so I'll just make this quick. The first thing you do to clean your brush is get as much paint off as you can just by doing this, just by pulling it out and move it around. Don't get in the dirtiest part of your rag and just go like that and expect it to get clean. Move it around, move it to different areas and really pinch it out. I mean, you're not gonna get it all this way, but this will save you a ton of uh, cleanup. 
down the road. So that's pretty good. I don't know about 10, 15 swipes here. And then this is, this is the hot tip of the day here. I've got regular old canola oil, just salad oil. This is like a buck 50. You can get this at any grocery store. Um, you can use linseed oil because linseed oil and canola oil are basically the same thing, uh, except different uh, um, types of plants are used to make the oil. Um, and I'm just going to do it right out of here because, well, you can't really see it. Can you? I'm just going to put it, I'll put a little bit in here. So I'll, I'll put some in my little tub. Not much. You don't need much. It's about like that. That will more than clean this brush. So put this somewhere where it doesn't spill all over my stuff. And then I'm just going to take a little bit of it like this. Bring it over here and you can see that that's really dirty. That's got a lot of, a lot of pigment in it. So again, take a little bit more, do it again. Oh, not as much pigment. I think maybe we're, we're developing a pattern here. Let's, let's have a look. I'll just do this over here. No, easier. I'll just go like that. So back and forth, get a little bit more. And I'm gonna do this until this gets nearly clear. And you have to remember, I mean, some people look at it and go, oh, it's still blue. Sometimes paints just stain the uh, surface or the um, material that you're using. There is no pigment coming out of this brush now. This brush is probably as clean as you're gonna get it using the oil. I'll do one more just to do overkill. So that, that, that brush is, is clean. Um, but if you look at the brush, it still kind of looks bluish. Don't worry about that. Um, that's to be expected. This is a clean brush but it's not done, you're not done yet. The last thing and really the most important thing at this stage is just to take, just get a little soap, like hand soap, put it in your hand and then just go back and forth with a little bit of warm water and do the same thing you did here. There'll be tons less pigment, but there'll be a tiny bit left in there. Um, and that is the finishing touch because you do not wanna leave oil on a brush. The oil is the thing, one of the things, that will ruin your brushes. So just do a little sort of lukewarm soap and water, clean that brush off and you're done. And this, this will save you hundreds of dollars over the course of your life or over the course of the life of your brushes. Um, if you clean your brushes, uh, I, I don't know how many times I've seen students, you know, first day of class say, oh, I've got all these brushes and they all bring them in. And it's, you know, they're like hot pokers. They're just it's like solid metal because they've not cleaned their brushes and they feel, you know, they feel like somebody sharpened a stick and they're not, the bristles are no longer any good. Clean the bristles, keep them soft, soap and water to end after you use the oil and your brushes will last you a good long time. So there, there's another hot tip of the day. All right, are we ready for a little uh, show and tell perhaps? I think I've I've gotten as far as I can on this one. Yeah. Hopefully, we've gotten a little sense of the uh, of the uh, impressionist approach to things. Let me just clean my screen up here. Okay. So I was just um, putting in the chat um, where you can sign up for Mike's uh, next three classes in March. Oh, oh yeah, great, excellent. Yeah, there's uh, this theme is continuing for the rest of the month. Um, there is a premium class, I think, in two weeks, which is not free. Obviously, it costs a little bit of money. I think it's 20 bucks. Um, and we'll look at Van Gogh in that one. Um, but the other ones are available. But they're all available, actually, to on the, uh, the website. So have a look. And also, um, if you want, if you're interested in these classes and you want, like, maybe a little bit more uh, extensive stuff and maybe a workshop setting, um, my, uh, I'm trying to point down there. <laughs> The website there. If you go onto my website and you want to just just sign up to get on my uh, mailing list, and I'll I, I'll do more extensive 
workshops uh, based on some of the things that we do here, but you, you can read about that on, on the website, but feel free to sign up for that. And also my Instagram is down there as well, if you want to see some of my work and, and on my website as well. All right. Awesome. Um, okay. Here we so go. So maybe we've got a few people that want to hold up their uh, painting and uh, show the yeah. world what they've been up to for the last hour. So we have um, Sarah. Sarah. All right. Nice. Nicely done. Just went with the, the basic outline of the flowers. That looks really good. Looks like you did a little kind of nice textural swirl with your uh, with your brush as you were doing that. That looks good. Very nice. And here we have. Uh, nice job, Sarah. I will remember. Oh, there's Diane. Diane. AKA Ed's iPad. All right. And very nice. Have... Oh yeah, you definitely got that sort of reflective quality and the and the vase sitting down nicely on the table. Really good. And Shantapa. Oh yeah, very nice. Really nice. Got the reflective quality as well. Excellent. And you can see you could work these more and, you know, this is just uh, the way I view this is I probably could work on this for another hour, another hour and a half. So if you want to continue after, after the fact, you can just sort of dial up that picture online and then get it there and keep working on it. But that looks great. Very nicely done. And then yeah. we have Jane Janowski. Um, oh yeah, there we go. Maybe put that a little closer to the screen, Jane. Yeah, there we go. Very nice. Good. Oh, you did a different vase. Is this your own setup? Sort of looks. I like the. I like the. Uh, the big bulbous vase there. Awesome. Yeah, nice. Very Can cool. Change? Very subtle uh, shift in value between the table and the and the background. That worked really well. Nice work. Okay. So Jane um, Vander Belding. And maybe move that one back just a tiny bit there, a little bit more. Yeah, there we go. Oh yeah, nice, good. Good, nice blocking in. You got everything looking really nice. And you're working a little bit bigger. So that's nice, that must be liberating. Whoops. Grab that. <laughs> um, yeah, that looks really good. Nicely done. A little pop of that red on the bottom right there looks great. Yeah. You're, you're like, well, I guess all right, yeah. Nicely done. Sorry, um, Rebecca. Yeah, one second. Sorry, Rebecca. Oh, you a nice painting in the background there too. Who do we have here? Rebecca. Oh, nice. You want a little more blue in the background? I like that. A little more expressive. A little more uh, Henri Matisse or uh, maybe even a Van Gogh kind of approach in terms of the color usage there. Very nice. And Tia. Excellent job. Yeah, oh yeah, very nice. Oh, I like the brushwork in the background. Really loose, very expressive. Nice job. And, and that uh, texture in those in those white pink flowers looks really good too. Kind of really comes out at us. Good. Sorry, I see Sib. I don't know if you're trying to hold your painting up. Um let me see right there. Oh, uh, there we go. No. Oh. Sib, what do we got? Sib, oh yeah, nice. Okay, it's a little a little darker, a little moodier setting for your for your uh, still life there. I like that. Looks good. It's not quite spring where you are apparently. It's a little bit sort of the depths of winter maybe. Who knows? <laughs> that looks good. Very nice. Okay, and I think that is it for today. Awesome. All those are fun. Um, we're gonna we're gonna definitely be looking at uh, artists of that vein for the rest of the month. Next week, I think we do a Camille Pissarro garden scene. Um, and then Henri Fontaine Latour is the last one we do. Um, and then a Van Gogh for the premium class. So, so be sure to check those out. And thank you all again. And um, I hope to see you next week. Have a great week and see you later. Nice work, Bye, everybody. everybody. Thanks, Mike. Bye.